And every morning when I woke up, I had three primary considerations. I ran, and I ran, and I ran. Margin Scope presents... The problem with the WAN is that the present government has been able to act with impunity since 1979. An in-depth look into the world of the largest sponsor of global terrorism. As well as the granddaddy of all terrorist operations. The nuclear deal allows Iran to do other aggressive things in the region. They've already started. The big question here is whether or not these uh, ballistic missile tests violate that nuclear agreement. The only reason to manufacture intercontinental ballistic missiles is to attack us. Why has ISIS never attacked Iran? Well, who do you think is behind all this? Most Americans would be surprised that they have had cordial relations with ISIS. Who is the number one threat to the security of the United States? Menace in disguise. Everybody should consider them their enemy. stability in one of the more troubled areas of the world. Before the Islamic Revolution of 1979, Iran was a Western-friendly nation and one of the closest Middle Eastern allies to the United States. Now Iran regularly disperses anti-American sentiment amongst its people, especially from the Iranian regime itself, currently led by Iran's supreme leader, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei. The regime is routinely hostile not only to the United States, but towards its allies in the Middle East as well. Why is the Iranian regime acting in such a manner? The problem with Iran is that the present government has been able to act with impunity since 1979. Uh, they were involved in the Beirut bombings in 1982, they're involved in uh, two embassy bombings, our embassies in Africa. Uh, their fingerprints are over the coal. Uh, we can track the deaths of several hundred Americans in Iraq by improvised explosive devices that were made in Iran. Uh, they were behind the uh, uh, cyber attack on Aramco, where 30,000 computers were destroyed. Uh, and they were behind the plot to assassinate the Saudi ambassador here in the United States. The complaint alleges that this conspiracy was conceived, was sponsored, and was directed from Iran and constitutes a flagrant violation of U.S. and international law, including a convention that explicitly protects diplomats from being harmed. And nobody's done anything uh, 
So they have actually felt like that they can operate with impunity. So until something happens to stop them, uh, or they come to the conclusion that the, the, the current policy is not benefiting them, then there's every reason to think they will continue. Iran's continued efforts to expand its nefarious interference in the region has manifested in its relentless pursuit of acquiring nuclear capability. The Iranian regime claims that it wants to use this capability for peaceful purposes. But should there be concerns with regards to their true intentions? The main concern is the nuclear deal allows Iran to pursue its other activities. It's less a concern that the deal will result in a nuclear weapon that Iran will use, and more a concern that because they have a nuclear weapon, they'll be free to do other aggressive things in the region. They've already started. Well, the Iranian nuclear deal, at the very best, only kicks the can down the road. It doesn't remove Iran's capability to construct a nuclear program, and in fact, after a decade, Iran is going to have a nuclear program that is much better resourced. But you've got a situation where people say, hey, Iran is abiding by this deal, but it's important to recognize that this deal has been so watered down that it has loopholes you could drive a tank through. This is America's interest, because America is the principal guarantor of security in the region, and particularly with respect to some of our closest friends. Now, we believe that Iran was marching towards a weapon or the capacity to have a weapon, and we've rolled that back. Congress. Okay, that's your opinion. That's I indisputable. That's no, Let me ask you this. That's Let me fact. ask you this, Mr. Secretary. That's a fact. Is it possible that Iran will acquire Russian air defense missiles in relation to the arms embargo lifting to protect nuclear sites? Possible or not possible? Say that again. I think the nuclear deal with Iran is fundamentally flawed because even though it's intended to be a tactical agreement, it's intended to address just one aspect of Iranian behavior, the benefits that are conferred to Iran as a result are strategic. Iran has received an enormous economic windfall, both in direct sanctions relief and also in expanded post-deal trade and relations with the international community. Under the nuclear deal that we, our allies and partners, reached with Iran last year, Iran will not get its hands on a nuclear bomb. There is no formal agreement. That's my main concern. And so we're in a situation where the Iranians pretend that they're living up to all the conditions and we're supposed to pay for it all, whatever they want, whatever they want us to pay for, whether it's ransom for hostages or whether it's money for uh, various parts of a nuclear program they claim is okay. Meanwhile, the agreement itself doesn't really exist. Nobody signed anything. There's just a kind of verbal agreement. The United States hasn't signed it. The Iranians haven't signed it. And have said from the beginning that they never would sign an agreement with the United States. So it's wide open. They can do whatever they want. We have not really truly restrained them. And you see that right now where they violated what we claim to be the restrictions on ballistic missiles. And they go right ahead and build new ones and test them and so forth. And the only reason to manufacture intercontinental ballistic missiles is to attack us. So it's crazy. You guys got into the deal that the ballistic missile, you, you bragged about it at the time that you kept the ballistic missile. You bragged about anything, Matt. Well, my number one concern is the non-nuclear sanctions relief that was agreed upon that pretty much came out of nowhere at the very last moment. Whether it's these pallets of unmarked bills, Swiss francs, euros that were flown in in the middle of the night under the cover of darkness to the advanced surface-to-air missile systems that uh, came from Russia. The United States has made sure that the Iranians have a lot of money. And it's unlikely they'll spend that money at home in Iran. They will use it to foment revolution. They'll use it to support Hezbollah. They'll use it to support Hamas because they can and because it serves their interests. This expanded trade, this expanded economic opportunity is likely to empower a range of very bad Iranian behavior uh, from 
greater sponsorship of terrorism, to greater military modernization and expansion uh, that is likely to very adversely affect American interests and American allies in the region. One of the most recent examples of Iranian violence towards American interests was in the Iraq War. Former U.S. Ambassador to Iraq, James Jeffrey, estimated that Iranian-backed militias were responsible for the deaths of more than a thousand American troops. The Iranian regime's murderous activities towards Americans were not limited to American military personnel, as they have been recently implicated as being tied to one of the biggest attacks on American soil since Pearl Harbor. U.S. District Judge George Daniels in New York issued a default judgment ordering Iran to pay more than $10.5 billion in damages to families of people killed in the terrorist attacks of 9-11. Judge Daniels also revealed in court documents that Iran provided material support to the perpetrators and architects of the 9-11 attacks, including Osama bin Laden. In fact, the U.S. Department of the Treasury designated three senior Al-Qaeda members as they were responsible for providing financial and logistical support to Al-Qaeda from within Iran. The question is, how is Al-Qaeda operating now? Al-Qaeda has, has changed significantly. It's got basically what we call franchise operations. You know, McDonald's, for example. There's no one owner of McDonald's. Each one of them is a franchise. Each one of them is a separate owner. And they have to have certain common characteristics, but even within those common characteristics, they're all run differently. That's what Al-Qaeda is. It's a terrorist franchise. So you can use the Al-Qaeda name, but your sources of funding, your operations, your goals are all very, very different. So with respect to Iran and Al-Qaeda, um, look, Iran is very opportunistic. You know, there's a saying in diplomacy, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, right? And in that sense, if Al-Qaeda is going against the United States or if Al-Qaeda is going against uh, friendly regimes in the region, then Iran can do business with Al-Qaeda. Even though Iran has made it easier for Al-Qaeda to conduct its terrorist operations, Iran's own brand of terrorism goes by another name. As well as the granddaddy of all terrorist operations or organizations, right? They've been in operation since 1986. They run Lebanon. Uh, they now are the major force on the ground in Syria. Uh, and they are bought and paid for by Tehran. So if you're gonna if you're gonna punish Tehran or take action against action against Iran for its support of terrorism, my question is why not start with Hezbollah? Right? You don't need Al Qaeda. You don't need to say, oh Iran's supporting Al Qaeda. They're they're in bed with terrorists. Of course they're in bed with terrorists. They've been in bed with terrorists. Hell, they've made lots of babies with terror with these terrorists. So come on. Uh, the real danger really is not one group or another group. The danger is a government that uses the power and resources of a state to promote, support, coordinate, and use terrorist organizations as an instrument of national policy. That hasn't changed. Uh, it's not going to change. And as long as that is Iran's modus operandi, everybody should consider them uh, their enemy. Well, Hezbollah is Iran. It's part of the regime. It's not as if there's a separate organization called Hezbollah and Iran supports it. Iran created Hezbollah, Iran runs Hezbollah, funds Hezbollah, trains Hezbollah, arms Hezbollah. So these people who say, well, they're going to start stop supporting it, it's like saying they're going to start supporting their right arm. It's very clear that the Iranian regime believes that the concept of exporting the revolution, uh, which it believes that groups like Hezbollah uh, do, uh, is a fundamental regime tenet. And it's also one that is likely to be empowered as a result of the nuclear deal. The more money Iran has, uh, the more money it's likely to allocate to the exportation of the revolution through these groups.
In addition to my job at the American Enterprise Institute, I work as a translator and analyst for the Open Source Center of the U.S. Military. And so I regularly read the Iranian press, and especially the Iranian defense press. One of the issues that most concerns me is that the Iranians have now decided to equip their military with AK-103s, a new generation of Russian um, weaponry for urban warfare. And the Iranians have made very clear that they see the future of their military needs in terms of urban warfare, much as they're conducting in Iraq, in Syria, and in Yemen. This suggests that Iran is planning for future engagements, not for peace and stability in the region. So I'm very, very worried about the future of Iranian aggression and its desire to export revolution. Remember, I mean, when we talk about an ideological state, it's not just window dressing in Iran. Both in the Iranian constitution and in the founding statutes of the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, it defines the purpose of the Islamic Republic as export of revolution. And when we listen to the rhetoric of Qasem Soleimani, the head of the Quds Force, as well as other senior Iranian officials, and not just the rhetoric, but the action as well, it seems fairly certain that Iran is going to take the windfall of money that they've received in the wake of the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action and put it into the service of destabilizing not only Syria and Iraq, but also Yemen, Bahrain, and they have their sights on Eastern Saudi Arabia as well. I think it's safe to say that whether you're looking to the north in Turkey and Azerbaijan, whether you're looking to the west and uh, Israel, Egypt, Jordan, whether you're looking to the south, uh, the Saudi kingdom and its neighbors, uh, everyone in the region is less secure than they were one year ago. I think Iran has a long-standing interest in expanding its influence in the Gulf, uh, particularly in what's called the Shiite Crescent uh, that extends, uh, including into uh, Saudi territory. Um, I think Iran has more capability to do that uh, over the last couple of years and moving into the future than it has ever had before. Uh, and I think the way Iran will do it, uh, we've already seen. The Iranian empowerment of uh, Shiite uh, forces uh, seeking change in places like Bahrain, uh, I think is a very good example of what we can expect in the future. Hezbollah and the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps have also expanded their terrorist operations into the Western Hemisphere. New questions about Islamic terrorists based in Venezuela. While he was alive, Chavez developed some deep ties with Iran, which has financed the terror group Hezbollah. Chavez I think that the, uh, for decades uh, we've seen that Iran uh, was absolutely committed, and, and particularly the IRGC, uh, committed to uh, uh, pursuing uh, terrorism as a part of, uh, of its foreign policy. Uh, tactics. Uh, and that concerns me a great deal, particularly here in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, 1992 and 94 bombings in Buenos Aires, uh, apparently committed by Hezbollah, aided and abetted directly by diplomats, assi diplomats assigned uh, to Buenos Aires. Uh, and those people are now wanted uh, by Interpol. Interpol. There are red notices for some of the people involved in those attacks. So Iran's track record here, going back decades, is a very troubling one. And uh, when we see them uh, fishing in troubled waters here, making common cause with the most anti-American regimes in, in Latin America, right here in our neighborhood, uh, sending uh, Mohsen Rabani, one of the people wanted for the uh, uh, 94 bombing, back here surreptitiously, clandestinely, uh, to meet with uh, contacts uh, in Latin America to recruit, to, uh, to radicalize. Uh, it's uh, very, very troubling uh, what they're trying to do. And also the search for uranium here, the use of uh, the relationship with uh, Venezuela to evade international sanctions, establishing financial institutions that uh, Iran was then able to use to uh, launder money and to, uh, to evade detection as it was moving tens of billions of dollars through the international financial system. Uh, these are all signs that Iran's uh, uh, anti-American policy is intact uh, and its close relationship with Hezbollah operatives working in Latin America 
indicate that that, that relationship represents a threat to U.S. interests. Iran has uh, the challenge of dealing with its neighbors, and they have a decision to make. Either you invest a lot of money to make yourself more powerful than your neighbors, or you work to make your neighbors weaker. It, it, it's a relative power. So I, I believe that their policy has always been to destabilize other governments in the region so that they're weaker. So in relative ter terms, Iran is more powerful. Uh, I, I, I believe that's behind the support for Hezbollah, the support for Hamas, and the current support for the Houthis, because they would like very much to see the Houthis operating as the Hezbollah on uh, uh, Saudi Arabia's southern border. Um, and f for whatever reason, uh, uh, Iran feels insecure, and they have focused on a strategy of instability. I think it has less to do with religion, although that is a consideration, but more to do with the political relationship. Iran has even used these terrorist groups to attack multiple embassies around the world. Most recently, the Saudi Arabian Embassy in Tehran. If you go back and look at the Vienna Convention, it's an international convention of which Iran is a signatory. It says that countries will respect the integrity of other countries' embassies that, that they host. So all of our embassies here in Washington, we have uh, uh, police and, and, and protection for the, the embassy and the employees there. Iran, on the other hand, has not followed uh, that convention. Uh, the attack on our embassy in 1979, they also attacked the British embassy several years ago, and, and the Saudi embassy the, just this last year. So I actually agree with Saudi Arabia's decision to break diplomatic relations because uh, you, you cannot let this kind of behavior continue. Iran has even repeatedly taunted American troops in the Gulf. Most recently, Iranian forces captured 10 U.S. Navy soldiers, whom the Iranians alleged that they were trespassing into Iranian waters. I think uh, the 2016 detention of uh, U.S. sailors by the Iranians, the Iranian military, is part of a larger pattern of Iranian behavior. Consistently, over the last several years, Iran has done things uh, in international waters, on Iraqi soil, in other places, to test the resolve of the United States and of our coalition partners in responding to Iranian provocations. I think the January detention was very much part of that pattern. Uh, it was an attempt to demonstrate to domestic audiences that Iran has uh, the upper hand militarily over a uh, hesitant West, and it was an attempt to demonstrate to international audiences that even though a nuclear deal had been concluded, Iran's uh, potential and Iran's desire and willingness to act aggressively in the region hasn't changed. I think that the uh, Iranians are determined uh, to challenge the United States at every turn, uh, to uh, assert um, that it can deal with the United States in this kind of way, uh, in a provocative way, uh, that it can um, abuse uh, uh, the normal ways of dealing with other countries uh, in order to send a signal that it can operate with impunity, that it can stand up to the United States, the great Satan, and um, uh, that it will, will do that, even standing up to our military. It's a way uh, not only of testing uh, the president and, and his national security team about how far they'll go, and how far they can be pushed, uh, but it also then sends a signal that they repeat, not only at home, but in the region, that the Iranians stand up to the Americans uh, and we don't have the will uh, to, to, um, uh, to respond in kind. Uh, and so this kind of provo provocation, you certainly don't want it to lead to uh, increased hostilities, but quite frankly, weakness is a provocation, particularly when you're dealing with a state like Iran. In addition to continued provocation of American forces in the region, 
Iran has recently used Houthi militias to attack U.S. destroyers off the coast of Yemen, including the USS Mason. Days, missiles have been fired at the American destroyer, the USS Mason. The suspects behind the brazen attacks, militias backed by Iran. I think uh, what we're seeing in Yemen is very much a proxy conflict, uh, a conflict uh, that, at least on the Shiite side, on the Houthi side, is fueled uh, by uh, Iranian support in the form of money, in the form of political backing, and also in the form of weaponry. And I think uh, whether or not that attack was uh, directed from Tehran, it certainly reflects the rising anti-American rhetoric that you see coming out of Tehran that Iran's proxies, like the Houthis, are picking up on, that Iran is increasingly willing to challenge uh, the Western presence in the Middle East. This is a very um, important way where these militants and the terrorists can score victories against the United States or, or, or attempt to score these kinds of victories. And quite frankly, uh, it's a prov provocation uh, if our president, if our uh, military don't have the capacity to, to and will to push back, uh, to respond to these kinds of threats in, in a, in a, in a uh, meaningful way. And uh, sooner or later, this kind of weakness is going to, to uh, cause very serious damage to our interests, to our personnel, uh, to our allies. Uh, and so I think it, it, it really demands a reassessment on how we're dealing with, with Iran uh, from the new president of the United States. I think they're trying to flex their muscles. And, and this, again, is part of Iran's strategy to get the United States to leave the Gulf. That has been Iran's strategy since we deployed troops there and for the first Gulf War. And, and the whole notion here is if they make the United States leave, then they will be able to act with impunity in the region and control the region. So for any act like the Houthis, assume Iran is behind it, and what they're trying to do is just make the United States leave. We're not going to. Hezbollah, Houthis, and other Iranian-backed militias are not the only terrorist organizations attempting to destabilize the region. The Islamic State of Iraq and Syria, otherwise known as ISIS, have conducted numerous acts of deadly violence against multiple nationalities, ethnicities, and countries, including Iraq, Syria, and even France, where ISIS was responsible for a horrific attack on a music theater in Paris. November 13th, 10 ISIS operatives attacked Paris. The question is, out of all the countries that the terrorist organization has attacked, why has ISIS never attacked Iran? Well, who do you think is behind all this? The, uh, the Iranians have done a masterful job of exporting extremism, but they don't lie out at home. And if you look at Iran, it's not a homogeneous population. It's a, a Shia majority, but not exclusive. Uh, and, and you actually have uh, the potential for a very fragile country because of the different ethnic groups. Uh, so they have used uh, uh, sectarian uh, violence and, 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 and uh, uh, forcing a rift between Sunni and Shia in the region as a means to destabilize in the region. But they don't allow that at home. So they don't come back to Tehran. The Iranian regime has hosted or has had cordial relations with many radical groups. I think uh, many Americans would be surprised, most Americans would be surprised that, uh, that they have had cordial relations with ISIS that they have cooperated with Al-Qaeda, that they have uh, been in cahoots with some of the most murderous individuals on the planet. And I believe it's difficult for uh, 
Americans by and large, but even those in the Washington policy community to look at this in a multifaceted way. We tend to look at things in a zero-sum approach. We tend to look at this as a binary choice. Uh, but as we've seen also in Syria, where the Assad regime has had tactical, uh, tactical connections with ISIS and with uh, some other, um, mo some of the most radical Sunni terrorists, their goal is first and foremost to wipe out moderate rebels, and if that and if that furthers the goal, they will uh, they will have those connections. They are more than willing to have uh, makeshift alliances with some of the most despicable uh, Sunni extremists. I think there is a misconception uh, in the in Washington and in other Western countries that since Iran is a Shia theocracy. Uh, some believe that it only will ally itself with groups which are uh, Shia. And I think this is again inaccurate and unsophisticated. Iran will, will ally itself with any group or any government uh, with which it shares common interests. So that group can be a communist group, can be atheist group, or can be a radical Sunni group. Uh, this is why some, um, some believe that uh, uh, some argue that Iran is not going to ally with uh, with the ISIS because it's a Sunni group and Iran is a Shia group. But I think both groups um, uh, have common interests in opposing the United States, uh, opposing Israel, and that is why there are um, the, the WikiLeaks showed that Iran. Uh, has harbored Al-Qaeda leader in Iran and I think that's partially why Al-Qaeda has never attacked Iran uh, or ISIS has never attacked Iran. So I think uh, uh, there is some kind of uh, strategic I think alliance between Iran and these uh, radical group because again they share a common interest uh, of opposing uh, the United States uh, and, and, and Israel. Iran is very opportunistic, and if they can uh, use people to advance their own ends, they will do it. So with respect to ISIS and uh, Al-Qaeda and, and Iran and what's going on in Saudi Arabia, let's be clear. Iran wants nothing more than for the House of Al Saud to fall. That is their, one of their major strategic objectives. I don't care what they say. It's true. We all know that. Uh, and they will work with anybody who helps advance that agenda. Um, and the attacks against targets in the eastern province, uh, I believe, are done the same way uh, Sunnis worked in uh, Iraq to foment a civil war. Uh, they are attacking mosques, they are attacking Shia in order to foment an uprising against the regime. Uh, that is in ISIS's interest and it's in Iran's interest. But it certainly isn't Saudi Arabia's interest and it's certainly not in America's interest and it's certainly not in the region's interest. So this idea that somehow Iran can be an ally in the fight against ISIS is absurd. Uh, the idea that Iran can be an ally in anything other than what Iran wants is absurd. Uh, which is why I find it so disturbing that we have basically handed Syria over to the Iranians, we've handed Iraq over to the Iranians. Uh, if it weren't for the Saudis, Yemen would be in the hands of the Iranians. Um, and this to me is a real danger that people in the United States don't fully appreciate. Peaceful means. But the fact is that Iran now has. We all don't like it. But whether we like it or not, Iran has developed experience with a nuclear fuel cycle. They have My fear is that by failing to Failing to act decisively in the region, we are making our own fears inevitable. If Iran is willing to support terrorist organizations to do their bidding, how does the current Iranian president, Hassan Rouhani, who has been frequently described by the West as moderate, gain legitimacy with such an extremist regime? You have basically in Tehran today, some 37 years after the 
victory of the Islamic re uh, Revolution, two camps operating inside that regime. And what is imperative for us to understand, and uh, frankly people don't pay enough attention to this, is that the visions of these two camps about the future of Iran are at times radically different from one another. So take President Hassan Rouhani. He's the spearhead of a moderate reformist camp, which basically aspires for Iran to become, let's say, more of a normal country. Wants to join the global economy, wants direct investment by foreign companies and so on. Wants to obviously remove all the uh, sanctions that have been imposed on the country. So that is a vision. That's a very distinct vision because everyone knows to get to that point, you need to make concessions. You need to adjust your policies. You need to uh, change behavior that you have had in the past in order to become the sort of normal. Opposing Hassan Rouhani and the moderate reformist camp are basically the so-called hardline camp, which believes the vision of Hassan Rouhani is a dangerous vision from their perspective. It's a vision in which if it successfully is implemented, they will become the losers at the end of the process. In a nutshell, they will think they will have less money, they'll have less political power, and some people would uh, argue, justifiably, they're resistant. So they're saying, if Mr. Rouhani thinks that we're going to change our policies in, in the Iranian economy, for example, or if we're going to change what we're doing in Syria, well, think again, Mr. Rouhani, because that's what we do best. From their perspective, from the perspective of the hardliners, that's what keeps them legitimate. If you take away what they're doing in Syria and Iraq and their hawkish anti-American positions, then what do they stand for? Because they can't create jobs, that much we know. What else can they do? How else are they going to, in this post-nuclear deal world, how are they going to justify themselves? And the only thing they've come up with so far is just to become more entrenched revolutionary in their rhetoric. And we see this almost on a weekly, monthly basis. The Navy of the Revolution Guards chasing American destroyers and so forth. The arrest of dual citizens. All these things are the same pattern. To say to the world that Hassan Rouhani is not the master of Iran. We're here too. And if you want to cut deals, political deals, economic deals, don't forget us. And when they arrest somebody in the airport leaving the country and Rouhani can't get, get that individual released, the point is made abundantly clear. Rouhani's powers are limited. And that, unfortunately, is the reality of the Islamic Republic, the duality of this country. It's not just one government. There is a government within the government or a government within the regime. And that makes the decision-making process, if you are a neighboring state or if you're a business person trying to cut deals with the Iranians, it makes the decision-making much, uh, much more complicated and unpredictable because how do you know what you're hearing from your counterparts in Tehran is going to happen because you know those counterparts have rivals that are constantly trying to undermine them. If the Supreme Leader and the IRGC are the ones who are really in control, then how did Iran's image become acceptable to the West in spite of its ongoing support for terrorism? Iran's image in the U.S. media changed 180 degrees from being really bad to being acceptable when two things happened, right? Number one, Ahmadinejad left power. And Ahmadinejad was really Iran's worst enemy and the media's best friend because he would say these crazy things and get everybody to think, see, see, Iran's just run by a bunch of whack jobs. Uh, so that's one factor. The other factor, so on the, on the, the other factor is Rouhani and um, uh, the foreign minister, right? They're great. Why? Because they, they say the right things to the right audiences. And the, Iraq, the Iranian foreign minister is the darling of the Western media. He speaks English, he sounds reasonable, uh, he presents a good face to the West. But, you know, that's all he is. He's a face, he's a mouthpiece. But he's not the brain, and he's not the muscle. Uh, the brain and the muscle are the IR, are, is, is Khamenei and the IRGC. That hasn't changed. So, to my mind, what the West has done 
is, you know, it's like giving a kid an ice cream cone, right? They're licking the ice cream cone, loving it. But meanwhile, uh, the poison is still in power and running the show in Tehran. Uh, and, you know, the lesson learned, the lesson I would take away from all this, for those who are concerned about Iran and want to uh, communicate the message of the message that Iran is a danger is what do they need? They need some good spokespeople, right? They need voices that appeal to Western audiences that speak English, that look like them, that sound like them, but that say the truth that, hey, fellas, you're being, you know, you're being sold a bill of goods here. Like, and there's this expression in English, you know, who wants to buy the Bro Brooklyn Bridge? Well, guess what? The Brooklyn Bridge is not for sale. But people are willing to give them money if they think they can get it. Same thing with Iran. It's like people are selling Iran to the United States, and, and, and there are those who are interested in buying, but they're going to find out pretty quickly that, uh, there's, that what they're being offered isn't worth a nickel. By now, it should be obvious that the Iranian regime is not only duplicitous, but is also willing to deal with the most violent terrorist organizations to achieve its aims. The question now is, how much of a threat does Iran represent to the United States? I think Iran represents a significant threat to the United States on a series of levels. Uh, Iran, since the 1980s, when the U.S. State Department began keeping track of these statistics, has consistently ranked as the world's most active state sponsor of terrorism and its activities in the region uh, and beyond uh, in places like Latin America, uh, in Africa, uh, have a real material impact on American interests and a material impact on uh, American allies. But beyond that, uh, another area of concern uh, that, I, that U.S. policymakers should be focusing on is Iran's growing capabilities in cyberspace. Uh, in the internet domain where Iran has demonstrated both a capability to create significant disruption uh, and also a d uh, willingness to do so uh, against American financial institutions, against uh, allied uh, corporations, uh, if its political objectives aren't satisfied, if its political needs aren't met. One of the essential uh, challenges, challenges in foreign policy for the United States today uh, is Iran's sort of relentless pursuit of nuclear weapons. There are some who say, look, they want to, you know, have the capacity uh, to, uh, to develop nuclear technology and all of these things uh, as a way to sort of uh, demonstrate that they are a, a global power, uh, but that, that actually attaining nuclear weapons might not be their, their, um, their real objective. But, you know, that's a very dangerous uh, proposition to test. Uh, and the concern of a lot of people here in the United States, across the political spectrum, quite frankly, Democrats and Republicans, uh, is that um, the president let, it, let his guard down. He's, that the agreement that he, uh, he signed uh, will put the Iranians within striking distance, it will make it less uh, a, a possible for the United States to monitor how close Iran gets to actually acquiring a weapon before it's too late. And that kind of proliferation in the hands of a radical regime like Iran's is a real provocation, a real threat, uh, not only to its immediate neighbors, to, but, but to broader U.S. interests. Well, it represents a fairly significant threat in the near term because, again, they're destabilizing the region and our allies. In the long term, uh, un unless Iran is integrated into the region again, we face the inevitable challenge of having to deal with their nuclear program again. That's in 14 years. Uh, so we have a near-term challenge of, of, of the threat to us and the region, but a longer-term threat and this is the real problem with the nuclear issue, is proliferation in the region. Because if Iran acquires a nuclear weapon, I'm not predicting that Saudi Arabia will, but its population will demand it in order to have a deterrent protection. 
So now you get proliferation of nuclear weapons and you've made the world that much unsafer. I, I'm an Iranian American and here in Washington, I often hear the cliche that Arabs and Persians have been fighting one another for thousands of years and that's just the way it is. Well, this is just plainly wrong. And if I look at the record of the Islamic Republic, you have to, in an honest assessment, admit to yourself that in 1979, it was Ayatollah Ruhollah Khomeini, the founder of the Islamic Republic, who threw the first stone in the direction of the Gulf uh, Arab states. Uh, by calling them illegitimate, by asking oftentimes for their overthrow, uh, and by promising to spread the revolution, and by being Shia-centric, becoming a sectarian entity in many ways that Iran had never been before. Iran has been a Muslim country for 1400 years. Shia Islam was never at the heart of the policy making process. The Khomeini changed that in 1979. And I think in many ways that has continued uh, ever since this calling for the other side to be overthrown. Now, when the other side reacts in fear, and says, well, you, you're trying to intervene in my domestic affairs and I won't put up with it. The Iranian side gets upset, gets defensive, and in the process forgets that it has started this back and forth. So I think in many ways, I would hope that we could go back to a period where the sort of wise men of countries like Iran and Saudi Arabia, the way they did in the early 1990s, get together and say, look, this enmity that we have, it's not something that is good for us or for you or nor is it sustainable. What can we do to reduce tensions? In the 1980s, like today, Iran and Saudi Arabia had cut diplomatic relations. But they came to a conclusion that was not good. They resumed diplomatic relations and that was, that was exactly what was needed then and I think that's exactly what you need now. Now, there's a lot of bad blood out there. There's a lot of bridges that needs to be built, but it can be done because end of the day, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Iran, the Emirates, and so they are neighbors. And at some point, they need to realize that the only way forward is to start that dialogue. And I think they will do that and the entire region will benefit as a result. And I hope we get to that point sooner rather than later. From 1976 to 1979, I was an instructor pilot in Del Rio, Texas and I taught classes, combined classes, of Iranian and Saudi pilots. So it changed after 1979. It can change back. So my fervent hope is that there, there will be a change. My personal view is the, the way forward would be through economic cooperation. Uh, you look at Saudi Arabia, you got Saudi Vision 2030. Uh, in Iran, you've got one of the oldest private sector economies in the region. There's got to be a way to have an economic conversation without first having a political conversation that would bring the two countries closer, or Iran closer to the region. The Iranian diaspora here in the United States is very, very strong, and, and they're wonderful people, as are the people of Iran. And they want what my friends in Saudi Arabia want. They want to live in peace. So it seems to me that the challenge ahead of us is to find a way for the region to live in peace because that's what the people of the region deserve. The people of Iran deserve peace, stability, and prosperity. But they also deserve a government that does not act as a global menace. A menace that uses the goodwill of its own people as a disguise.